Okay, but now I'd be live. Professor Ketan, can we go live? Yes. Good evening to one and all who have joined us today, respected guests, faculty members, participants, and the viewers who are watching us live through various platforms. I, Jhar Shubhangi Umesh, on behalf of Debate and Discussion Society, Campus Law Center, University of Delhi, welcome you all to be a part of this insightful and interactive session with Mr. Tarunab Khetan. He is a professor of public law and legal theory at Faculty of Law, University of Oxford. This interactive session is based on a pre-circulated research paper by Mr. Khetan on Supreme Court as a constitutional watchdog. Since it's an interactive session, I would humbly request you all to post your questions in the chat box. And for an easy flow of the session, I would also request you all to please put your mics on mute. Today's session she is an assistant professor at Campus Law Center, University of Delhi. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rubhangi. Uh, a very warm welcome, Professor Khetan, to uh, the Campus Law Center, University of Delhi. Uh, uh, today, we have uh, Professor Khetan has graciously agreed to uh, interact with us on a very important issue, uh, or rather a recent debate which has emerged in the constitutional law. Uh, Professor Khetan, uh, as Shubhangi already mentioned, is a professor of public law at the University of Oxford. Uh, he is also a founding general editor of the Indian Law Review and the founder and advisor of the Junior Faculty Forum for the Indian Law Teacher. He has worked extensively in anti-discrimination law uh, and has also played a prominent role in the drafting of the Anti-Discrimination and Equality Bill, which was introduced in the 16th Lok Sabha by Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Now, as already mentioned by Shubhangi, uh, today Professor Khetan would be responding to the questions and comments on his paper, which has already been circulated amongst you, at the Supreme Court as the constitutional watchdog. Uh, the participants are requested uh, to use the raise hand option, uh, and they can either choose to pose the question on the chat box, or they can also uh, ask the question directly to Professor Khetan. And we would invite, and we would, uh, you can use the raise hand option so that we may invite you to the floor. However, before we open the floor for discussion, uh, I would take the liberty to briefly introduce some of the major arguments made in this paper. This paper argues that proper case management is not just about efficiency, rather, it also impacts the legitimacy and integrity of the Supreme Court. Overburdened courts have less time to deliberate on adjudication. And this has affected its ability to provide uh, adequate reasons to the judgment that it delivers. Since judges are obliged to give reasons and this obligation to provide clear, cogent reasons ensures judicial accountability and a failure to do so threatens the legitimacy of the Supreme Court and the courts in general. Professor Khaitan has argued in his paper that the Supreme Court of India has been spending its major resources on performing its appellate function rather than performing equally its role as a constitutional court. And in addition to that, due to its cavalier attitude, uh, as said by Professor Khetan towards reason giving, it contributes to ambiguity in law, which in turn is adding to the pendency of problems in the court. 
In context of these issues, what has been argued in this paper is that these problems can perhaps be fixed by bifurcating the Supreme Court into an appellate and a constitutional division, which would provide a better balance between the two roles that the Supreme Court of India today holds, that are of a constitutional court as well as an appellate court. Now, uh, with this, Professor Ketan, uh, uh, I would also take the liberty of posing the first question to you, and then we can open the floor for uh, questions and comments. Uh, now, in the recent debate that uh, between you and uh, Mr. Sanjay Hegde, who is a Supreme Court advocate, senior advocate in the Supreme Court, uh, he has uh, mentioned that uh, this uh, division or creation of a new institution does not help much because we have also had the experience of tribunals being created. And despite the fact that tribunals were created to lower the burden of the appellate courts, it ended up increasing the burden of the courts. Uh, so we still have appellate jurisdiction appeals going to the to the Supreme Court of India. So how would you respond to this specific argument? Well, first I should start by thanking Anu uh, very much for organizing this um, uh, session. And uh, in particular, um, the, uh, the um, perseverance with which you uh, you made sure that I found time in my calendar. I wasn't trying to be difficult. It was just a busy time, but I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you all for um, for joining us for this pre-read um, <coughs> workshop. On the question of tribunalization, um, the observation that tribunals have increased litigation, not reduced it, is accurate. But it's it's based on the assumption that there will continue to be an appeal from the final courts of appeal to the Supreme Court. The proposal is uh, instead to effectively separate the Supreme Court and make it into two different courts. Now, um, what that can, this can be done in two different ways. You can either um, make sure that the court itself uh, is internally divided, and there is a constitutional division and an appellate division, um, which which will make sure that the uh, role of the court is ring fenced in its constitutional function, or you create two different courts uh, through a court of appeal and the Supreme Court. But there is no suggestion of an in, of of the court of appeal being of adding another layer of appeals. So there wouldn't be any appeals on regular mat matters which are not constitutional to the Supreme Court from the Court of Appeal. That is, so, so that uh, problem does not arise. The either solution will only work if it is mainly geared towards ring fencing, the Supreme Court's constitutional jurisdiction and making sure that that is not eaten up by the appellate jurisdiction. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes, the floor is open for questions and comments. Uh, please feel to raise hand uh, ask questions and comments. Uh, yes, Shishi Jai. Please go ahead. You may unmute yourself. Uh, a very warm evening to you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to put forward uh, our questions to such a wonderful research paper. So my question is with regards to your emphasis on the strict logic in the decision-making of Supreme Court. As we know, the legitimacy of any institution within a democracy comes from the people itself. And keeping this in context with the highly political nature of proceedings in the recent time within the Supreme Court of India, whose results, whose judgment will have spatial and temporal effects, uh, is it possible for the Supreme Court to take a strict logic driven, uh, to give a strict logic driven decisions which are completely separated from the society? Let's say if a Supreme Court give a decision which is insulated from what society wants to do, will it not uh, erode the faith in the democracy, erode the faith in the judicial institution itself? Thank you very much, Rashid. Anumaha, Anumaha, you are happy for me to answer each question as it arises, right? Yes, yes, definitely. <clears throat> so let me start by just saying that there's a difference between the source of legitimacy for the system as a whole and the source of legitimacy for each constitutional institution. 
So you are absolutely right in suggesting that the system as a whole derives its legitimacy from the people. But that is not to say that every institution within the system also needs to derive its legitimacy directly from, from the people. In fact, any such system uh, would be a disastrous system to have. Uh, and it would be a disaster for the people themselves, let alone any, anybody else, right? So, so here is a thought. And by the way, many jurisdictions, the United States in particular, have tried uh, with ensuring direct popular legitimacy of institutions like courts. Uh, a colleague of mine, Professor Les Green, uh, said in a seminar once that if, if you worry about power of unelected courts, and the damage they can do, come to Texas and I'll show you how much damage elected courts can do, right? So institutional legitimacy of courts does not rest directly on the people. It derives itself, of course, from the normative legitimacy of the constitutional system, which, is, which in turn rests on the people. But the legitimacy of the court rests on other factors. Now, legitimacy is a, uh, is a, is a complex concept and it has two particular conceptions that I need to distinguish in order to properly answer your question. Uh, subjective legitimacy is the legitimacy of the institution as perceived by the people and other actors. And objective legitimacy of the institution is its legitimacy in terms of whether it's in fact performing its job as it should be. Right? So your question primarily concerns, I think, the subjective legitimacy of the Supreme Court. It will be helpful for me to keep seeing the question uh, question while I'm answering, Shishir, if you don't mind keeping your video on. Thank you. Um, so any democracy needs to have a public discourse that understands and demands a legitimacy of courts based on what courts are meant to do. If courts are meant to represent the people, then we don't need courts because we have parliaments to do that. Right. What is so you can't so what I'm suggesting is that the subjective and the objective legitimacy issues are linked and ought to be linked. And you would not design the court in the way it is designed, the court has no mechanism of finding out what the people want. Parliament does. Courts don't go to the people. Courts don't stand, judges don't stand for election. Right? If you wanted courts to do what the people want, you will design them very differently. You'll design them like parliament. Right? Courts have a different role to perform. And that role is primarily a doctrinal role. So, one final thing I will say, I know it's, an, it's a longish answer, but I think your question had many layers which needed to be uncovered. So the final thing I'll say about your question is that constitutional courts need to be politically savvy. Don't mistake my answer for the suggestion that what you characterized as logical decisions is all that courts need to do. No, courts, of course, have an interpretive role in, think, in, in determining what the law is, in laying down the law, and they do this in light of the socio-political and economic context and moral reasoning, right? So that is not in doubt, but that is something entirely different from doing what the people want the court to do. Thank you. Are you? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, in your paper, you have mentioned that uh, we as a legal academy have failed in holding judiciary to account. Sir, in this context, Supreme Court has also been referred as the impregnable fortress. So there are many numerous of times when we see that reforms have been struck down under the veil of independence of judiciary. Sir, uh, I know that Supreme Court also had certain limitation too. Sir, how can we strike uh, a fine balance between these two things, sir? 
So the question of accountability of the judiciary is a very fraught one. And uh, I, I suspect that you have the NJAC judgment in mind in asking um, this question as well. So <clears throat> quite rightly, we do not demand that judges be accountable to politicians. The entire point of independence of judiciary and the rule of law is that the judges can decide cases without fear or favor. That does not mean that they have no accountability. There is, given the judicial role, there is a, an expectation of a normative function, of an institutional function that courts need to perform in light of the law, right? Now, even if there are five different possibilities in a given case that are permissible because the law is unclear, that does not mean that courts can do whatever they like, right? A, a good accountable court will still have to make a finding that is within one of those five options, right? So while the law, even when unclear, may allow many things, and usually unclear cases go to the Supreme Court, but not always, while it can do many things, it has many options as it were to choose from. It cannot do whatever it wants to do. And when the court does whatever it wants to do in blatant disregard of the law, then it is the duty of the bar and the academy to hold the court to account. And this kind of accountability is a discursive accountability. It's an accountability of the institution by experts who understand its internal logic its internal mode of functioning and hold it to account on its own terms. Now, of course, you can have a completely different mode of criticism of the court, which is outside the bounds of this technical, internal, expert-led accountability, right? So you can, you can criticize the court for reaching bad judgments. You can criticize the court for being neoliberal or being pro-rich or pro-majority or whatever, right? Those political criticisms are not invalid, but they are a different, they have a different quality to the internal criticisms that the bar and the academy have to uphold, right? So what the paper is saying is that while we can permit a much greater latitude to the court when it comes to getting things politically wrong, politically or morally wrong, we have failed in even upholding the thinner minimal case of internal adherence to the law type accountability from the court. And in failing to do so, we have actually aided in the creation of a system where anything goes. Some, a system that Chintan Chandrachur calls uh, panchayati adjudication, right? Where the law is kind of besides the point, doesn't really matter so much. All we care about are outcomes, not how judges reason. And that is a failure, not just of the court, but also of the academy and also of the bar. Oh, sorry, I, I missed out on the second half of your question, which was on, um, uh, on the use of judicial review of amendment powers to uh, strike down attempts to change the mode of judicial appointment, right? So judicial appointment is a key feature of judicial independence. It is not the only thing that matters. Uh, we also need to think about judicial tenures. We also need to think about post-retirement benefits and perks and who can give them to judges. We also need to think about uh, increasing informal interaction between uh, judges and senior politicians. We, we have had a long practice of a healthy distance between elected officials and judicial officials, uh, not meeting informally, not meeting 
uh, in camera, not meeting without minute takers and officials present. That's changing now. Judges not becoming MPs, not becoming governors. That's changing now. Right? So, so all of these things are relevant to accountability, not just the appointment system. But insofar as the appointment system is concerned, you have to have a system which allows for a political voice. So I think the collegium system is a problem. I don't have very strong views on whether the political voice necessarily should be stronger than the judicial voice. As we know, the NJAC judgment was decided on the ground that the judicial voice was not the strongest. I don't have strong views about that. I think both judicial and political inputs have to be sufficiently strong. And if the political voice is stronger, I don't mind that. What I do think is absolutely critical is that the government and the opposition have to have an exactly equal say in the appointment of all constitutional officers, not just judges. That is the problem. Government of the day and government of tomorrow, because a democracy believes that future governments will be different from today's governments, they both must play a role in electing, transferring, promoting, removing any constitutional officer. Judges obviously have protection from removal in terms of impeachment. But uh, to my mind, it's the idea is explored in a paper, which I'll post the link to in a moment. Uh, the idea is called weighted partisanship, where you create a body by overweighing, overrepresenting the opposition and underrepresenting the government to give them an equal say. Dr. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Professor Ketan. I have two questions. One is, uh, uh, how do you see the role of lawyers, particularly senior advocates you have mentioned in your paper that uh, they have contrib contributed to increase in SLP? And uh, there have been instances where uh, uh, the law which has been changed was not brought to the notice of the court. So it uh, somewhere shows uh, that our, our lawyers are also not well versed. Like I can give you a case of uh, a case related to payment of gratuity act. The law was changed in 2009 and in I think 2019 or 2020, there was a case in which uh, uh, the court relying on the old precedent of 2005 said that teachers are not employee as far as payment of gratuity act is concerned. When this appeared in some law, court took judicial notice of it and uh, re-heard the matter and came out with the correct decision. Another is the role of academia. You have critiqued, uh, you have put uh, some sort of blame on academia also that uh, uh, they, have, they are not questioning Supreme Court. Uh, the way uh, earlier academia used to critique, like Professor Bakshi, we have Professor, uh, uh, so many professors, okay, they used to actually question uh, uh, judicial decisions. But now uh, we see that now this, sort of questioning has started. But as far as uh, teachers, uh, law teachers are concerned, uh, what you have to say, how uh, they can be trained? Because I read about uh, Delhi Law Faculty that uh, Professor Tripathi actually uh, uh, initiated a sort of training for teachers. Some teachers were sent abroad and they came, they contributed to uh, this, whole idea of questioning uh, law and legal institutions. Thank you. There are many, many layers to that question. <laughs> I'll try to do my best, but if I forget, you'll have to remind me. Um, quality in the bar is obviously a problem. Um, no bar is uniformly excellent. Uh, the Indian bar is not an exception. Uh, but perhaps the Indian bar's tolerance of uh, 
fundamental incompetence is quite high. Um, and I think that is also uh, bad for litigants. It's often predatory on, in terms of the relationship between the bar and the litigant. I'll just say one thing in relation to bar and the proposals in this paper, which is that the paper takes aim, well, it's my empirical findings, right? I didn't start out to take aim at the senior bar, but the data shows that senior advocates play a hugely distorting role uh, in expanding the dis admissions docket of the court, right? Um, and, and most of these, a lot of these cases get into the system uh, only to clog it because they are ultimately uh, dismissed, right? But it's the, it's the prowess and the weight of the senior advocate that gets the case in the system. And it's unsurprising that a judge, a two judge bench sitting on admission hearings for 60, 65 cases a day, um, typically has, there is a, there's some very good uh, literature coming out now uh, on the empirics of it, has about, spends about a minute and a half on average, something like that, to hear an admissions matter, right? Um, of course, the judge will use proxies, like the weight of the advocate, because judges are also human beings. They're not, uh, you know, superhuman. So, so we, sh we can't blame the judges for using shortcuts because the system makes it impossible for them to do their job. Um, what this means is that the problem of incompetence and cases where updates in law um, are not put before the bench where cases are decided in ignorance of the law are amplified precisely because of the volume. There's far too much going on, right? Now, when I used to intern with the Supreme Court lawyers during my undergraduate years, uh, many years ago, one hearing for an admission matter in the Supreme Court was what, five lakh rupees? I don't know, it's probably a lot more for the top lawyers, but that's the kind of money they make for a minute and a half on their feet. And it works for the client because the client's chances of getting a stay increase manifold. And once they get a stay, the salki chutti, right? Then you can, then life takes over, then you can whatever. Clients often are not interested in winning the final case. They're more interested in the interim stay. So it is rational for the client to spend, in fact, a lot of cases uh, were the sort where the client would hire a very senior lawyer for the admissions hearing, but a much cheaper junior lawyer, an AOR, for the substantive hearing. Now that would not make sense unless you understand the logic of the system, right? Where the battle is for the state because you know you're not going to win the case. Um, the way my proposals will work is that while they will hurt the senior bar, they should advantage the junior bar enormously uh, if the court moves to uh, uh, admission in civil cases on written briefs, right? sections of the junior bar that have the competence to write good written briefs. It'll have to be tire page limited. You know, you have to tell your case in 20 pages. Uh, all, all courts have case management strategies. You have half an hour to, uh, to uh, all, all well-functioning courts, right? So Indian Supreme Court has not employed any of these case management strategies. Anyway, so that's so much on the court. Coming to the second part of the question, the academic one. Uh, so I'm sorry if, if my paper gave the impression that I think there was some golden age of Indian academy and scholarship that has somehow been lost. I think that the Indian legal scholarship uh, scene today is better than it has ever been. Uh, so the criticism is not somehow to regain some lost uh, utopia. Things were terrible, um, you know, and in three big scholars don't make an academy, right? Uh, for the first time, we have an emerging community of scholars in India, 
we can converse with each other. For the first time, you know, if I may take, uh, you know, some credit or blame for um, a serious journal on Indian law that adheres to peer review norms uh, is completely indifferent to who is submitting the paper. We have rejected papers from Ivy League professors from the US, from ministers. You know, we don't care who you are. Does your argument pass an anonymized peer review process? That is what matters. Right? These are the things that make a good scholarly system. Do you mentor young scholars, right? So three you know, grand professors are good for nothing if they don't mentor young scholars. So, um, so I think we are in much better days today than we have ever been. And obviously there's, you know, I'm not blaming them either because you have to work with a critical mass. And I think um, the mushrooming of undergraduate law schools in the eighties and the nineties has created that critical mass, which ha a lot of them have now gone on to uh, join the academy. But what can you do uh, as an individual academic, even though things are better, they're still terrible. So, you know, you're not, you're not paid abysmally, I hope, anymore, like, like academics used to be paid, right? Uh, it's still not uh, great pay, but, you know, even if the pay is all right, the working conditions are terrible. Uh, we, we, you know, as far as I understand, by the way, I don't understand the Delhi, uh, uh, law center very well. So maybe you guys are an exception and if you are kudos to you, right? But we don't have uh, permanent contracts for academics. And if you don't have that, you don't have academic freedom. Uh, most Indian universities think that uh, the more number of hours an academic spends with students equals better education. Uh, so you are always lecturing. Uh, in my undergraduate degree, I wrote 60 research papers. And that's very much within course research papers uh, over five years. Uh, I think I would have been better off writing one research paper that was properly supervised. So more is so a lot of a lot of the problems of quality are sought to be fixed by quantity. More lecture hours, more project work, more exams, right? And these are not conducive to good education. I don't think the students are any better. I think fewer contact time with you and a lot more self-education in a system that's demanding differently, not in terms of uh, constant exams would be better. But also to relieve the teachers from not just the drudgery of a huge volume of teaching and marking, but also uh, administration. Where is the time for research? And where are, where are the incentive structures that facilitate research? And where is a community of fellow scholars who are willing to sit down every week and discuss one work in progress from a fellow academic, not with the view to tearing them down, but to help them make the paper the best it can possibly be. These are the things that you need for a flourishing academy. Uh, a new initiative is called the Junior Faculty Forum. It's not based in an institution, uh, but you know we try to workshop one work in progress draft paper by a self-identified junior academic in a friendly environment, where the goal is not to show how clever I am or how you got things wrong, but to help you write the best paper you can. That is something that needs to be replicated in every institution. Protected time for research, sabbaticals. Right? For every two years of service, do you get a year off where you can focus on your research? So those are the things that need to change for teachers to, so I'm not saying, you know, we have a fantastic culture of op-ed writing in newspapers. That is good, that needs to be preserved. Public engagement is important by scholars, but you also need scholarship. Scholarship needs, to come first and then you translate that for public engagement. But we completely bypass the scholarship process and therefore a lot of the scholarship just becomes policy briefs. As editor of the Indian Law Review, and this is the final point I will make because I know that I've given a very long answer to this question, even by my usually long standards. But you know, 
the number of papers I get in the Indian Law Review, which identifies a problem, and basically is thoroughly normative, just telling you how we should fix it, is astonishing. I'm like, can we wait, pause for a moment and try to understand what the problem is? Where is the evidence? Sometimes trying to fix things without understanding it is worse than doing nothing. Let's do some research, proper research, not this is how I would like things to be. And if I may give the ex example of this particular paper, the proposals are not drawn from the top of my head. Right? They're based on empirical research, they're backed up. I don't start with what I want to happen and then work backwards. You have to start with the problem and ask the what question first. What is going on, not what should happen? I'll shut up there. Dr. Pari. Thank you very much, Anumeha. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to our speaker. First of all, congratulations. I think it's a fantastic uh, talk that you've been uh, giving, and I really like this format. Uh, I have one uh, small little question. A lot of us um, feel that, uh, like you have already touched upon one of those questions previously, that um, the Supreme Court as well as Court of Appeal, and um, so a lot of us seem to feel that uh, there is a little bit of confusion regarding what should be the role of the Supreme Court. Should it be only an appellate court? Should it be appellate plus constitution as it seems to be today? Or should it be only constitution? My point is, if it is only going to be a court which is going to adjudicate on constitutional issues, do we actually need 34 judges? So um, this is worked into the model uh, in the paper. Uh, what is clear is that the data is very clear that high courts cannot be the final court on all non-constitutional matters. So you do need at least one layer of appeal above the high court. That much is clear mm -hmm. from the data, right? Um, now, the only question is whether those two layers should be located within the same institution. And if within the same institution, do they have their individual turfs joined up or separated? So, whether you do institutional separation as Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, or whether you do intra-institutional separation of the Constitutional Division and the Appellate Division, uh, it, that distinction matters for a different reason, which I'll mention in a moment. The number of judges would have to change. Um, that said, um, for properly performing both tasks, 34 may not be enough, uh, we need to think about, so the problem is also a very lax admission process system. Uh, it's a vicious cycle. Of course, high courts get many things wrong, but often they get things wrong because of conflicting Supreme Court precedents and uncertainty in the law. The huge volume of case law before the Supreme Court and two judge benches deciding them creates greater uncertainty in the law. So in some ways, so the, the cycle keeps repeating itself. Whereas if the court takes fewer cases, far fewer cases, and just decides all these cases as if it was setting, laying down the law of the land, over time, you should see legal certainty emerging. So there's a difference between norm, norm uh, creating courts and error correction courts. The Supreme Court currently works as an error correction court. Now, of course, for key matters, for criminal law matters, you have to have the court functioning as an error correction court because the, um, the cost to justice will be too high if, if we don't allow, don't correct errors in the criminal side. But at least we can start with a civil question. Constitutional matters being heard by two judge benches is ridiculous. So I think on constitutional questions, the court has to do a lot less, but do it a lot better. And so I think the Supreme Court can easily function with two or maybe three permanent five judge benches dedicated to constitutional issues. And then you have to carve out the, uh, the 
you have to think about what's the best design for a court of appeal. Uh, and there, uh, I, I said, I'll say why the intra-institutional and, and inter-institutional distinction matters. That matters because of a different policy objective that has been a long-standing demand, which is um, di regional diversity uh, of the court. So one, it'll be much easier for a court of appeal uh, to be located in four different regions of the country if it was carved out of the Supreme Court. And so these things can be fixed. I think even an internal a single Supreme Court can have divisions sitting in multiple uh, places. But one of the reasons for imagining a different Court of Appeal is that it can sit uh, in four different uh, locations in the country and obviously reduce the costs involved for litigants who are based outside Delhi or far away from Delhi. So that's, that's the second um, issue that connects with it. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, so uh, my question is that, uh, so in your frank opinion, what is the role of the CGI, uh, the Chief Justice of India, as the leader and the topmost authority being held accountable for the quality of judgment in not only the Supreme Court judgments, but also in the lower courts? Keeping in mind, uh, sir, the judgment that was uh, passed by the Maharashtra High Court, uh, given by Pushpa Ganediwala in the skin to skin uh, judgment, sir. Look, I don't think that. Um, so, that there are different types of accountability issues here. And to the extent that the Chief Justice is the administrative head uh, of the judiciary, um, he or she, hopefully one day she, will be accountable only for uh, administrative matters personally. Um, there is, of course, institutional failings in the kinds of judgments that courts get away with. But part of the failure of our academic system is also that whatever little scholarly attention is given is given to the Supreme Court. Uh, negligible to the high courts and trial courts to bully job. Absolutely nothing, right? So. Um, so you can't hold one individual responsible for what thousands and thousands of judges write across the country. Um, and frankly, we have vested far too much power in that institution of the Chief Justice. So instead of making it even grander, because remember that with all responsibility comes power. So if you make the the institution of the chief justice responsible for every bad trial court judgment, you will also then have a demand or uh, the accretion of uh, chief justice's powers to transfer, to remove trial court judges directly. It's already far too concentrated power. I think what we need to do is to have a conversation about how to reduce uh, the powers of the chief justice in allocating cases and appointment of judges, et cetera, and to uh, make the exercise of those powers a lot more accountable and a lot more trans transparent. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Well, sir, I had a question for you that in your paper, you talked about the docket explosion, which is caused due to special leave petitions. Do you believe that this docket explosion has also led to a problem of docket exclusion as there are so many cases which go unnoticed when it comes to their deliberation? And how can the judiciary solve this problem of docket exclusion? I think what you have, what you're referring to is um, the court deliberately just keeping some cases on file without scheduling a hearing, uh, I suspect like the powers of the Delhi government for Delhi sensitive cases. Uh, that is a huge issue. Obviously, um, the massive docket allows the court cover to hide behind and say we have a lot to do. 
and therefore we can't uh, take up all matters. And it's part of the, uh, one of the sim. So most of these types of cases tend to be politically sensitive and tend to be constitutional in character. Cases that are basically put in cold storage. Said so we'll, you know, um, it's, it's like the interim stay without actually granting interim stay. So you, A, if you had a protected ring-fenced constitutional jurisdiction, uh, it will be harder to do that because the number of cases that are constitutional will be fewer. They will of course be, and you have to have a system with some discretion on prioritizing cases. You can't take discretion away because there are there will always be circumstances where some cases must be heard quickly, uh, expeditiously. So the only way to deal with this is to have those norms and parameters public. What are the norms for... So first you have to separate and ring fence the constitution document. Then you have to make public the norms that apply to the listing of cases. So, you know, a sample would be the normal rule is first come first serve. Uh, so we take it sequentially and then these are the exceptions by which cases can jump the queue, right? And they can, you know, we can debate about it. You can get it right or wrong. And then you have to transparently apply those norms uh, in a way that can be checked by the bar, by lawyers, by the academy, right? A system along those lines is the only one that can inspire trust uh, in what the court is doing and more importantly, not doing. Uh, good evening, sir. So there is this notion where the landmark judgments are associated or rather linked to be happening because of the government which is in power. How far do you think people understand the concept of separation of power? You're asking me a sociological question, um, which I can't answer because I haven't done any research on it. I don't know. Um, how, how, how much people understand uh, separation of powers. Um, and I don't know if any research, anybody else might have done on it, uh, on, on how far people understand separation of powers. I do want to note uh, certain recent efforts on um, encouraging, increasing, let me, I'm just looking for a, recent blog post, let me just uh, post it here. Uh, recent efforts on increasing constitutional literacy. Um, there's an excellent blog post by my colleague, uh, Arun Tiruvengadam, I've just posted the link in the chat, uh, which aims at precisely um, increasing the understanding of the constitution uh, amongst lay persons. And um, may I be permitted to share another link? This is uh, a second link, um, which is a series of interviews that I have done uh, in Hindi, understand, explaining different constitutional topics uh, as easily as I could with Rajesh um, and Surbhi. So, a lot of work is happening, but again, you know, just as the academy is work in progress, public engagement on the constitution is also work in progress. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is an uh, interesting comment in the chat uh, by uh, Mohammed Singh. So I will just read out the question. Uh, what he says is, why is the reform being carried out at the Supreme Court level? For instance, the high court could be bifurcated into similar to the division which I believe is already the case in a few high courts. The superior of these divisions could act as final court of appeal and only constitutional matters be taken up by the Supreme Court. 
So the main reason is that the number of cases, so this was a, my study was a quantitative empirical study. It wasn't a qualitative uh, study that actually read the cases, right? Um, but to the extent that you believe the system sort of works by its internal logic. And you know, I, I understand and appreciate that that's a huge assumption and high courts often write better judgments than the Supreme Court. But in the minor matters uh, on bail, on uh, in minor only in terms of, uh, you know, the public interest involved, uh, but I, I'm not saying bail is not important, for example, but say property disputes or landlord tenancy disputes, right? The number of cases that are reversed, high court judgments that are reversed in the Supreme Court is so large that making the high court say final code of appeal will impose a significant justice cost in the system. So, um, Unless the system is, in ordinary cases, massively dysfunctional, at least in the cases it is deciding, there aren't, there aren't very good reasons to think it is. Um, so things tend to go wrong, typically in cases that matter, uh, that are politically salient, etc., right? or where there was a lot of uh, incompetence in the legal representation at the lower level. But if the system sort of works, then making high courts the final level of appeal will be hugely problematic uh, because, uh, because these cases will not be, uh, these judgments will not be reversed. Um, there's also something to be said for at least two appeals on most significant matters to private individuals significant either in terms of their personal liberty or in terms of their property or other interests or rights. Now, not two appeals as a matter of right. The second appeal can be discretionary based on clear criteria, uh, but a second appeal is usually very important uh, for a well-functioning legal system, even if selective. Uh, and for a large country like India with a unitary legal system, uh, you need some level of centralization of the second appeal to have a measure of legal uniformity across the country. The other option will be to federalize the judicial system where uh, the high court will be the final court on state matters and only on central list matters and maybe concurrent list matters, you can have appeals. But we don't have a federal judiciary. We have a unitary judiciary um, in which uh, the, the second layer of appeal has to have some measure of centralization. Even creating four courts of appeals uh, will create some issue of disagreement between the different courts of appeals and there will have to be a mechanism resolving that. But with tw you know twenty odd high courts uh, being the final court of appeal, uh, without any system of resolving uh, disagreements between them, uh, will be very problematic for a unitary system. Uh, there is another question by Muhammad. Uh, what says is will having four appellate divisions further add to legal uncertainty and conflicting judicial precedents set by these divisions, especially in non-constitutional matters. If there are conflicting positions taken by the four divisions, how can such conflicts be resolved? Yeah, so this is exactly what I was referring to um, previously, which is that, um, so here the uncertainty will not arise because of the ring fencing of the constitutional matters against appellate matters. That itself will not re give rise to uh, the uncertainty because the, the, the jurisdiction is different, right? So each case will go to either the constitutional route or the non-constitutional 
The uncertainty will arise because of the additional proposal that the Court of Appeal should sit in four regions. And that is when you have the prospect that two courts of appeals disagree on a legal matter. Um, the hope is that when we reconstitute the courts of appeals and require really reduce the number of cases that they hear, even on the appellate side, and require larger benches to hear them, uh, that these disagreements will be very few and far in between, not like the two judge benches today that basically decide in ignorance of the law and therefore create a lot of conflicting judgments. So if a court of appeal decides a matter in ignorance of a precedent set by a different court of appeal without referring to it, that should be a clear case for a review of that case by the same court of appeal, right? It should be asked to, re to revisit, reopen that case because it ignored uh, relevant uh, precedent, right? So, so you can come up with internal rules that reduce accidental conflicts, conflicts that are not thought through, conflicts that the court does not mean to create, but is just too overworked to check if it's creating a conflict. That will still leave some cases where two different uh, divisions of the Court of Appeal or two different Courts of Appeals, depends on how you create them, will consciously disagree on a matter of law. Having read each other's judgments and decided accordingly, they will, they will say, no, we take a different view from that court. There will be cases like that. And for those cases, you will have to have a dispute resolution mechanism, which will probably be the Supreme Court. But that, that kind of difference between the, between the two courts of appeals will itself make it a case of a constitutional character. Uh, so the, the, the creation of four court of, courts of appeals can only work if you also do uh, the homework with everything else in the system, which is really significantly narrow uh, the volume of civil appeals uh, and reduce the uh, burden of courts, reduce the role of senior advocates, uh, ensure that larger benches hear each case, ensure that cases decided in ignorance of precedent are reviewable, um, and things like that, to reduce uh, the burden of accidental disagreements. Good evening, sir. Um, sir, you have mentioned in your research paper that the special leave jurisdiction was intended by the framers of the constitution as a residual jurisdiction that was to be invoked only in the most exceptional cases, since the bulk of the court's time is taken up by these jurisdictions. So my question is that are there any specific parameters that one needs to keep in mind um, before invoking such jurisdiction? Um, yes. It's a special jurisdiction. See, the constitution very clearly lays out uh, cases where an appeal can lie to the Supreme Court. Then it also allows statutes to create uh, a pathway of appeal to the Supreme Court. Then the court has judicial review powers. The special if jurisdiction is designed as an exceptional jurisdiction. And this is by, ab by abundant caution, where the framers thought, well, we can't predict the future completely. Have we missed out something? Is there something that the Supreme Court should hear? And by way of abundant caution, here's the residual clause. And this kind of exceptional clause, when it becomes 70, 80% of the docket, that is self-evidently a problem. So, you know, in terms of parameters, I don't know. I can't tell you whether a docket which had 5% SLP cases or 3% or 1% would be within the bounds of reasonableness, would, would be within the bounds of what you would expect to see in an exceptional jurisdiction. But 
it's absolutely without doubt that 70% of the docket is not exceptional. Something has seriously gone wrong here. Uh, the system is not functioning as it is supposed to function. If uh, a residual exceptional jurisdiction is, is the overwhelming bulk of what the court does. And we don't need to settle uh, on precise numbers. Parameters can also be um, worked out qualitatively. So, uh, a, a, you know, there's been a long-standing demand on the Supreme Court to to confine, especially jurisdiction, by through law, by laying down the conditions. Uh, which when satisfied alone can trigger this jurisdiction, the court has consistently refused to do it, despite some judges occasionally trying to get something instituted. Right? So this is a problem of the court's own making and the court refuses to, to bind itself on what it can hear precisely because it gives it, it, gives it unrestricted power to to intervene in any case it likes. So the court has to become disciplined for itself to function properly. There is another question uh, by Shubhaki. Uh, in your paper, you have mentioned about how the courts have been overburdened. The responsibility of leapfrogging the judiciary lies with the executive as well, as they are the biggest litigants in the court. What are your comments on this? This is not a matter I have studied. I do know that uh, the government is a repeat litigant. Um, there are certain rules in some other jurisdictions, rules like um, the state may not appeal in criminal matters. Um, so th there are things that can be done to reduce that. There's obviously also a huge problem uh, with the way the bars uh, pay uh, is structured, which means that there is very little incentive. In fact, there's no incentive, huge disincentives for lawyers to, um, to resist a settlement. Right? If, you, if you pay lawyers per appearance, then it is in the interest of the lawyers to make more appearances. Um, whereas if you, uh, if you work out a different kind of method of rewarding lawyers, then you're more likely to see out of court settlements because often it is in the interest of the litigant to settle, uh, but the lawyer does not want to settle. When it comes to the government, obviously it's complicated because uh, the state is huge it does a, it does a lot of things um, but clearer guidelines a greater desire on the par, part of the executive to um, to settle cases when it can at least uh, genuine cases and an overall of the criminal justice system which uh, which requires a serious attempt to uh, decriminalize vast swathes of human activity. There is, there is a substantial over uh, in our justice system and underfunded police and uh, judiciary just can't cope. Uh, you know, and you, you, can't, you can't expect the police force to solve all problems in society and to deal with uh, social problems, family disputes. Uh, I'm not talking about domestic violence. I'm talking about property disputes and family, for example. Right? So uh, I think a, a serious attempt to decriminalize um, a, an, a, an openness, an attitudinal openness to settle will be good starting points. Uh, but in terms of uh, what other factors can help reduce government litigation. It's not a matter that I've studied directly. So I'm not able to comment. I'm sure there are many other things that can be done to help them.
Thank you, Professor Ketan. I know we have reached one hour, but there is one last question if you have time to ask. Sure. Charlie. Well, uh, well, good evening, sir. So the research paper says that the Supreme Court of India spends most of the time dealing with legally and constitutionally less important disputes. And often, uh, you know, it is admitted, it's saying that uh, there are regular hearings by overworked and poor, timely poor judges. So the question is, why are such cases given more priority, even when there are cases which are more important, which are pending in the Supreme Court of India? And secondly, how can the Supreme Court strike a balance between such cases and address this lacuna? Uh, Charvi, that's what the paper is about. That's the whole paper, right? Um, I, you tell me why, why these cases are given more priority. Basically, private interest. Think of judicial time as a scarce national resource. We should care about where it is spent. You know, just as the country's foreign reserves, there would be a public debate on how it is spent. If it, if it was spent on, say, less important matters than more important ones. Likewise, judicial time is a very scarce resource and we need to have a debate on where it is spent and it is being spent on important, but relatively less important matters than more important ones. And that is a problem. Thank you, Professor Keta. Uh, I'm sure all of us has, have too many questions still remaining with us, but I think uh, we have taken already one hour of our time and we can conclude the session. Um, I would like to thank Professor Ketan for agreeing to come to TLC and I hope in recent time we will get we will, we will get an opportunity to see him in person as well. Uh, and looking forward to more such interactions perhaps if your time permits. Of that. course. And thank you very much for hosting me, Anumaya. And thank you all for your um, generous reading and your questions. Bye-bye.